Thank you, Chad. Good morning. I call it from poppies to pot because, as Jack mentioned, I, I do have an agricultural background. And think about this. In the grand scheme of things, a generation from now, cannabis will be renowned for having revealed the endocannabinoid receptor system. We all have it. It's how we're hardwired. So what I'd like to do is start off with this being a CME or a continuing medical education course. How, how many health professionals are here? Can you give me a show of hands? MDs or DOs in particular? It's one of the reasons I love coming here, because of over, I believe, 400, 450 attendees, more than half, are medical professionals. Th this talk is not geared only to medical professionals, but as an attestation, we're required to do this in the beginning. And if you note, the third attestation from the bottom, it says if I'm discussing any product that is off-label, I'll disclose it. Well, here's the disclaimer. All Schedule One substances are by definition off-label, so we'll proceed with that and that I have no commercial ties to be concerned about. I, I gave this talk uh, as a keynote for the Emerald Cup last December, and I used this slide as the title slide uh, because science and reason really do matter in this issue. The science is fairly obvious. The reasoning are more of the ethics, the right thing to do. And so that's why the subtitle here was sort of fairly well received. So I like to start off with actually a case presentation for those of you professionals. Uh, it's about a lady, 68 year old, disappeared by the way in the New England Journal several years ago. And she's got metastatic breast cancer to the lung and the thoracic and lumbar spine. She's getting chemotherapy and she has low energy, minimal appetite, substantial pain in her thoracic and her lumbar spine. Now, for nausea relief, she takes something, as she does as well, but for minim with minimal success for the nausea. And she's been taking acetaminophen or Tylenol uh, without much success, sometimes oxycodone at night to provide pain relief. So she visits with her primary care physician and she asks, is it possible that marijuana or cannabis can help me alleviate the nausea, the pain, and the fatigue? And she lives in a state where that actually could be accessible. So. What would be the responsible action that an educated physician, emphasis on educated, is able to discuss with her? So can I see a show of hands? Who thinks she should get pot? Marijuana, cannabis. Okay, who thinks she should get that right off the bat and give it to her right off the bat? Okay, it's interesting because a, a clinician would likely include that but it's not really a first-line treatment for Marilyn. What she needs is a radiation to her thoracic and lumbar spine where her pain's emanating from, perhaps as a complement to that, but I don't want you to forget that there's still a basic right way to treat patients, and it's more than holistic. It's going with the advances that Western medicine has advanced through. And so in this case, that's what it's from, and we get a lot of the idea for where this is in 2018 from a publication that came out a little over a year and a half ago. So you may have in some of your bags that were given to you this card. It's meant to reflect the current state of knowledge. And at this point, everything else is what we call anecdotal. And even if we have crowdsourcing, think about this as a conundrum, since that's the title of the talk. Crowdsourcing, for the purposes of, of wanting to know if something works, if the very thing you're testing for is phenomenally renowned for impairing memory, how reliable is that patient in reporting how they do? Understanding that there's the overwhelming incidence of euphoria, and there's nothing wrong with euphoria, but it does influence the patient's disposition. So this here then is a list of what's available as far as formulary. If you notice in the bottom right corner, just a matter of a few weeks ago, CBD or cannabidiol was rescheduled the first plant-derived chemical to be such since really 1937, even though the uh, Controlled Substance Act dates to 1970. The point I'm trying to make more important than anything else is the target is not the plant. It's actually the receptor system that the plant's chemicals work through. And as any archer knows, if you start to look at your arrow instead of the target, you lose that pure focus and it's easy to shoot misses. So this is a paper that came out in 2013, and not just by any researchers, but by NIH and two MD, PhD researchers who really do know clinical medicine. And 
It's highlighted yellow there, and I'll bring it up so you can see this better. It said that modulating the endocannabinoid system activity may have therapeutic potential in almost all diseases affecting humans. What a statement that is. I can't remember reading anything more profound. It got my attention, and so I just wanted to set that because it's a very complicated subject, and I hope to make this digestible for you. Um, and I know I'm going to miss some things, some of the questions you may have, so please resource me after the talk later today, tomorrow, and I'll be happy to entertain questions. As a plantsman, I want to share with you that the first understanding I had about plant-based chemicals and how they work with human beings is when you look at the two life source molecules that humans versus plants have, hemoglobin and chlorophyll. They're remarkably similar. They only differ by what's called a cation, a two plus cation in the central part of the molecule. And good doctors know that in order to optimize hemoglobin, say in a pregnant woman, you give extra iron, as much as you need, because it's critical to fill the function of hemoglobin. Well, a farmer does the same thing with magnesium. Any of you that might be cultivating understand that when a plant is stressed, it needs its full complement of chlorophyll, and magnesium fills that spot. This, to me, was sort of a moment of eureka, because the chemistry is not that different. And in fact, a plant's chemical powers, I have a great healthy respect for that. And so Mike Pollan, actually, in one of his books, The Botany of Desire, talks about how the plant's chemicals nourish us and poison us. They delight our senses of sight, smell, and taste. They calm our nerves or wake us up. And they even change the content of our minds and the experience of our consciousness. Think about that. And so at a previous talk, I had someone raise their hand and say, hey, doc, you know, scientifically, what does it mean to be stoned? Good question. Pretty basic question to ask your physician, right? Well, at the answer, we don't really understand the true details of consciousness, so how can you explain a change of consciousness? Leave that to the poets, right? So this is what it's about, and I want to bring up things now of the major conundrum, which happens to be prohibition, and some of the things that we have to be cognizant of because our country has two governmental authorities, the FDA versus the DA, DEA, and they do different things. They fulfill different functions. But with respect to scheduling, they look at a Schedule One definition as such that the drug has to have a high potential for abuse, no currently accepted medical use, and a lack of accepted safety under medical supervision. And that's actually specifically in the United States with the currently accepted medical use. So that right in there is a confounder if it's illegal. So it's not only cannabis that I want to try to impress upon you have, have plant chemicals that are used medicinally and therapeutically or recreationally by human beings for thousands of years. Certainly opium and cocaine are botanical medicines. A little while ago we were speaking about tobacco. The speaker that preceded me brought up some good examples of how tobacco is used and it's still the leading cause of preventable death smoking in the world. And then what about these two botanical medicines in a sense, chocolate and coffee? Can you imagine if those were illegal? but they're all plant-based alkaloids. Cannabis is different. Uh, the ingredients in cannabinoid medicines are not alkaloids, which is another reason it makes it so fascinating. This is Raphael Meshulam, and in 1964, well after things like cocaine or opium had their chemical structures known, he, he found the chemical structure of THC, the biosynthetic pathways. But more important than that, to me, the sentinel moment was 1992. Why? because that's when anandamide 2-AG, the body's own ligands that THC mimics, remember, it's not the other way around, were identified for the first time. Now that defined it as a receptor system and in many respects for healers and law-abiding doctors, the conversation at that point sort of ceased being one of social injustice and now shifted to healthcare because now you knew the mechanism of action on how it worked. And I would think that through the next few slides I'll show you a little later, you'll have a little better understanding for how it works. This is not one of those slides that there's going to be a test on. But this is known. This has been known for years now. The right side of this diagram shows the, the um, components of olivetolic acid and dibrinic acid on the left side are other chemicals that each have their own bioactivity. And then when they have acid forms, as you know, is not necessarily the way the plant has it, but what happens upon heating, then you have a bioactivity that is different even than the non-acidic forms. 
So each of these substances, even though I've highlighted in blue THC and CBD, are of clinical interest. In particular, I've yellow highlighted THCV, which some of you may have heard about, in that if there is a yin and a yang understanding about THC versus THCV, it would be skinny weed, some people have called it, but in essence, then it may be something therapeutic for metabolic syndrome, which is gonna be a scourge in the next several years. Uh, the genetics of this is not at all poorly understood either. So as modern science advances, this is a slide I'd like to show. It's a beautiful slide. Phytex came out with this a few years ago. And other than being pretty and colorful, for those of you who don't truly have a good working knowledge of understand how the endocannabinoid receptors work, this is helpful because when I trained, and even when students are trained today, we think of nerves transmitting signals almost like a one-way street. Yes, you can have afferent and efferent pathways through the spinal cord, but in terms of at the actual synapse between two neurons, we think that it goes from presynaptic to postsynaptic and that's it, and then gets transmitted downstream. Not so. And so this is a slide that shows on the bottom the postsynaptic surface where both anandamide and 2-AG, the body's own ligands, travel retrograde backwards as a little feedback loop interacting with the cannabinoid receptor on the presynaptic side that then influences whatever that presynaptic side releases, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, all these things are influenced through endocannabinoid receptors. And when I say all these things, this was a list of known receptor systems as of 2013, it's bigger now, but it has effects on almost everything in physiology, which is why that first paper said it has the potential to treat almost or to influence almost everything disease-wise that was known to mankind. So how it works is by changing the receptor's conformation so that the signals that that receptor gives that influences what's being released uh, vary in very subtle ways, constantly, all the time, and in ways that in here, if you see from the top slide that we'll start with now, you have things that are called positive regulation, including agonists, partial and full, as compared to negative regulation, which includes agonist, antagonist, inverse agonist, a whole variety of things that change the total output of what this receptor can be fine-tuned to do. It's doing it in each one of you right now, all the time, real time, and we even know what that receptor looks like. This is a, a project that was done a couple years ago, and if you see in the middle, that's actually a diagram. It looks cartoonish, but it's actually taken in its proportionate of a CB1 receptor. If you look closely in the middle, you'll see a test molecule right there. You see the green with the blue and red. Uh, that's a test molecule that they use to figure out the shape of the receptor itself. It finds its place through different charges that configure it specifically just where you see it. And that's kind of cool because this is just a test subject, but we know that there are lots of other chemicals that can fit into that receptor to influence its function downstream. And one of the ways that that receptor is, is adjusted is not by blocking it or not by totally activating it, but by changing the conformation so that when that receptor sees a natural ligand, its conformation may be changed in what's called an allosteric way. Allosteric modulators are fascinating. There's a big future ahead pharmacologically for it. On the left is the precursor molecule for, for basically body steroids, pregnenolone. I think we'll have a speaker talk about it later in this conference. And it's a negative allosteric modulator which tends to reverse some of those CNS or, or CB1 brain effects of THC specifically. That's kind of cool if you think about a specific THC, essentially antagonist, but it does so through allosteric modulation of that receptor. On the right, it's an interesting, not, maybe not coincidence, that cannabidiol work that way too. So as far as research goes, the most frequently cited researcher in the world is Vincenzo De Marzo. And many years ago, actually, I think in 1998, he said that relaxing, eating, sleeping, forgetting, and protecting those five things might be some of the messages that are produced by the actions of the endocannabinoids alone or in combination with other mediators. Those other mediators today could include terpenes, as you know, with others effect. So how does it work naturally? It is really the brain-gut connection between sleeping and eating, all CB1 functions. 
And in fact, if you look at the diversity of how that brain-gut connection really works, it's been known by homeopaths for thousands of years, and, and the ancients knew that there's some connection between the brain and how we're hardwired with the gut. That connection is actually the endocannabinoid system. And so it, it's, it's revealing lots of things, including the effects on the mind that include forgetting. And when I mentioned before how important it is when you consider crowdsourcing as a major confounder from anecdotal reports if something's working or not, uh, the ability to forget is essential. It's how we're hardwired. And if you don't think that's important, it happens, by the way, in an area of the brain called the hippocampus. If you look at it a little up close, it's that little structure. But that little structure is critical to our experiences. It what makes us also human beings to reason based on memory in the past. And the effects in the center yellow there where memory is, is just one of the places in the brain that THC works on. If you'll notice, it works on the other areas for movement, judgment, sensations, vision, memory. I'm an anesthesiologist. We're concerned with breathing. When you can't breathe, nothing else matters. The reason why you don't overdose and stop breathing like with an opiate when THC is consumed or pot is because you see there are no receptors in the brainstem. And so it doesn't activate that driving force that has our, our signal to breathe. So that's actually helpful. But forgetting, getting back to forgetting, I almost forget forgetting about forgetting, it's kind of essential when you think about how human beings not only interpret pain, but what about pleasure? Do you think it would be healthy for human beings to remember the extremes of pain? Hmm? Any mothers here? Uh, we would all be only children. There'd be no need for the word brother or sister if women remembered extremes or extents of, of pain. And, and I like to give an example, just a, a brief story. Let's pretend it was thousands of years ago here, some nomadic tribes. And, and we're foraging to find something to eat or, or drink. And out of nowhere comes some wild prehistoric beast. Think something scary, like the size of a Buick. And, and it chases us up a tree. And we're all up a tree, hearts pounding, maybe we're bloodied. And that beast down at the base of the tree can't go get us. Nightfall comes, it goes away. If we can't get the sheer terror of that moment out of our minds, we're not going to be able to fall asleep, recover, and be out of there at the crack of dawn before that beast comes back to devour us. So forgetting, even acutely like that, is valuable, and it's essential to our well-being. But what about the pleasure side? Think about that a moment, because now I'd like to talk about what happens when people seek pleasure as compared to not seek, but are adverse to pain. Both are not necessarily the healthiest way of being, those people seeking constant pleasure may be more prone to addictions and things like that. But using the same example I just gave a moment ago about prehistoric tribes, imagine again the same prehistoric tribe walking around. And in that prehistoric tribe, how do you think people had pleasure back in those days? Sex. Okay? So imagine in that tribe you've got two characters, and we can call them Caveman Og and Lady Pleistocene, and they're always lagging behind the rest of the group, going at it. If you were a saber-toothed tiger, which two do you think you'd find the easiest to pick off, not paying attention? So actually forgetting the extremes of pleasure is part of also how our memories are, are dealt with, and that's an endocannabinoid function selectively. CB2 receptors we know much less about. However, the future really is in that. Because CB2 receptors also change the physiology in subtle ways, but they pop up in response when they see a disease. And they actually anatomically pop up where you'd expect to see them. And it's not only down in the abdomen where people may think all CB2 receptors are. They're elsewhere in the body. Somebody with Parkinson's substantia nigra, you'll see them pop up right there. And so why they're there is to adjust the normal physiology to deal with that disease. So essentially, and this is the power of the statement about CB2 receptors, they're what allows the disease to become chronic. We all die from one thing on our, birth, on our death certificate, but along with it, we die with many other disease processes that our body holds in check by having them allowed to become chronic. And that's what happens through CB2 receptors in particular. The ancients knew something about this, whether Ayurveda or traditional Chinese medicine. And when I say they knew something about it, I love to show this slide. This to me is a smoking gun. There's an acupuncture chart on the left, and those of you who may know traditional Chinese medicine 
would know something called chi. It's the flow of life forces that are known to go largely through the abdomen, not through the brain, not through the heart, not through the lungs. But the ancients appreciated that. On the right, you have what's called a PET scan. Okay, and what you do is if you take radioisotope labeled chemicals that bond with CB2 receptors and you inject them two hours later, you'll see them distributed where not only the red, that also is influenced by blood flow, but the green, the yellow, the red, the orange, everything that is largely abdominal, which is where your immune system organs are, are where the CB2 receptors are. Now, isn't this interesting? Because we're taught the immune system responds to what are called protein invaders, a bacteria, a virus, we ramp up, we, we attack it. Isn't it interesting, though, that CB2 receptors responding to a disease are in the same location that allow us to deal with it. Because without those CB2 receptors or without an immune system, we'd be dead in hours, if, if certainly within days. So the way that the ancients thought of health, and we think now immunity means health, um, seemed to have an understanding that it happens in the gut. The speaker before did a great uh, rendition of the history of pot, but now I'm going to take you way back to the very first life forms on the planet. And you can go back to the order of 543 million years ago, half a billion years ago. And that's when the earliest uh, endocannabinoid systems have been found to exist. So they're not only in mammals and human beings, they're not only, believe it or not, in vertebrates but there's some invertebrates that have this too as the way we're hardwired and deal with the stresses that nature and life bring through a lifetime. The plant didn't appear on, on this planet until 130 million years ago and human beings just a million or so years after that. So the plant is not here for us. We've been hardwired long before the plant ever thought of having any influence on us. And today's plant can be traced back about 10,000 years ago. After the last ice age, only certain plant and animal species that were able to survive in, in the conditions that were in most of the globe did. Most everything else became extinct. So if you see the red highlighted areas, they're called refugia. There's one that's in Southeast Asia off the eastern slopes of the Himalayas, another up towards Europe at the top left of the slide. These are areas where human beings are first documented to have encountered cannabis. And in different species forms, the one on the left was more of a hemp varietal, the ones on the right included hemp, but also had different drug varietals. And not 10,000 years ago, but 700 BC, this is the tomb of a, of a shaman in China. And the two vessels that I have the arrows going to there had cannabis, but it wasn't just any cannabis, any part of the plant. They were the female flowers. And that's where most of the concentration of these bioactive chemicals came from. Known to people 700 BC, another beautiful slide was shown how then it went around the world. But the point I'm going to make as an agricultural scientist, it was human agriculture that brought pot around the world, not an animal eating a seed and defecating it somewhere else, or a bird flying with it, or, or a coconut going over the ocean and landing on a foreign island. Human agriculture and cultures brought it around the world with us, 10,000 years, and this is teleology, it's not something you can use on a PhD thesis because you can't prove it, but it kind of makes sense to me that 10,000 years is, is an indirect indicator that it might not work too unfavorably with our genes. And, and by the way, that's compared to the last 30 or so years where we have changed the plant, and I'll show you some slides later, where it may not be for the best, although some things that had been hybridized out of that plant, including cannabidiol, now are being rediscovered. So, in terms of pain, I mentioned that in 1992, that was the sentinel moment for cannabinoid receptors and understanding the value, not only of the plant, but the receptor system. Same thing for pain from endorphins going back to 74. But opium from the poppy, cocaine, um, tobacco, nicotine, these are all what are called alkaloid chemicals. They, they're different than pot. And Robert Robinson in 1947, he, by the way, around the turn of the century, discovered the precursors to cocaine and also worked with morphine, understood that the indigenous people hold a great deal of knowledge that could be of value in healthcare. He received the Nobel Prize because of understanding that plants can benefit healthcare. And so the understanding of that then in 2018 comes to the modern AMA, the American Medical Association, and that's our stated mission. But in 1937, which is when we had just covered the Marijuana Tax Act, 
we came out and we said that, it, you know what, it's an unknown quantity, but it might have important uses in medicine and psychology. So it was basically saying that the AMA encouraged unfettered education and research and that its medicinal use should be regarded that way. It didn't regard it as particularly wise to, to enact that, mar that Marijuana Tax Act. So physicians are confronted with now where is something legal, where is it not, what's the law of the land in my jurisdiction, my state, my neighborhood, if you have moratoriums in certain areas. This is a global map on pretty much where it's at still today as compared to our states. Uh, there are some very interesting things here. I, I've got a slide for Florida, but let's suffice it to say now that we've got nine states, most recently Vermont, and this is the political science uh, speaking now, that now came on to, to have recreational or adult use, like kids don't get it, um, recreational cannabis accessible. The reason I'm referencing Vermont to you, and this is not medicine now, this is the political legislative science. Before the October, uh, November 2016 election cycle, when you had not only Washington State, Oregon, uh, Colorado, and Alaska as the four original states then that had recreational cannabis, but now you brought Nevada into it, you brought California, large state, most populous state, sixth largest economy in the world, now has recreational pot, and Maine. Well, the thing that's in common with all of those states is that they have arguably among the most isolated borders of any of the United States. Think about it. Even California, nobody lives across its borders to speak of. Why is that important? Because the intent of prohibition is to contain that which is prohibited. And a federal government would not have much challenge of doing that in those particular states. Massachusetts was that eighth state. And Massachusetts really matters because tens of millions of people live right across Massachusetts borders. Vermont was the first state a few months ago that not by popular citizen vote, but by legislative measures, legislated that Vermont would be a, a, a recreational state. Why? Because they certainly would have an objection to their citizens going to take product from Massachusetts. It does find its way over state lines and to enrich Massachusetts coffers. So I'm not convinced that the genie is going to go back in the bottle that way now. Uh, Florida is now just finding its way into this as well. So we look for guidance. And we have Surgeon Generals who since 1982, when I would have graduated medical school, have had opinions ranging from against it to for it to no opinion to nothing that they're going to say. Or What I'm pointing out is that from a federal level, even our Surgeon Generals are appointed by the sitting president. And so it tends to reflect the disposition of, of who's in control up in Washington. Not an easy thing, though, for, for physicians like myself to deal with. And that's why I sort of bring this to light, because we're, we've got anecdotal information, and yet it's mostly being promulgated by the stakeholders, the docs trying to learn what to do. And yet the horse with that science-based, uh, evidence-based data and reasoning, that's the key I wanted to discuss towards the end of the talk here is key. We got it a little backwards. So how's a clinician, and that's what my background is, supposed to balance a clinical practice with patients who want to get cannabis? It's challenging, because that clinician doesn't only have a license that's in the state where they're practicing, they have a second license, their DEA, Drug Enforcement Agency license, allowing them to prescribe medicines. Now that's, that's like our tool bag, and there is precedent for physicians who venture into this space to have that license threatened, if not revoked. It happened in Massachusetts, actually, in 2013. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that's one of the reasons why physicians are not embracing this, and even the education part, but the clinical practice of it has to deal with that as one instance. And the second one happens to be that most of the states that have promulgated laws do so by saying which chemicals you can use. Many states starting just with CBD, now advancing to THC, and then specifically for what diseases you can use it for. Last time I looked, that was called the practice of medicine. And physicians will reject being legislated the practice of what we're trained to do. And society expects of us as an educated body to be able to determine, not to be legislated. So in terms of clinical practice, then, you've heard of this phrase, perhaps start low, go slow. 
Well, it's interesting, and that's the way most drugs are. So for THC in particular, yeah, CBD might be a different paradigm because its safety profile for side effects and ill effects is so safe that it might be more appropriate if someone's taking it for something somewhat more acute and doesn't have the luxury of time to build up dose, dose, dose until they re find the relief they're looking for to start from a higher dose and taper down. That may be on a cost basis too, but it's important to understand the difference. Now, anybody know where this turtle came from? Finding Nemo, remember the stoner turtle, you know? Okay, so <laughs> the reason I'm pointing this out is this sort of speaks to the point that I was bringing up that when patients come and they want to tell you, yeah, it worked, uh, if they're under the influence and part of that influence is affecting memory, how reliable is their reporting? But uh, that, that's what I wanted to point out, that the goal is to optimally affect the patient's endogenous system. I, I question if there really is such a thing as endocannabinoid deficiency syndrome. That doesn't mean people can't do well with certain chemicals that affect it. But I don't think we're hardwired and born with that particular system deficient. Uh, nor would basically any other vertebrate be born that way. These are systems that are there to keep us in the game, to keep us responding to the curveballs that nature throws us. So in Florida then, this appeared a few years ago, and I was thinking this could be my mother, and certainly the doc there that's got a Florida Medical Association badge looks a little bored. He's actually saying something that shows he's incredibly um, ill-educated, by prescribing Oxycontin instead of pot because it may have unintended consequences like the doctor may lose his license. So this is where it was at as far as a parity, but it's not a parity. It's a very real concern because the CDC now, especially with all the opiate crises up with accidental overdoses, has a current disposition which is very different on the use of how we uh, get opiates for patient care. Uh, certainly it's wonderful and valuable for acute pain. Chronic pain gets some people in trouble, and brief uh, trials of it, otherwise with acute pain, is absolutely okay. Dosing. If you can't control your dose, your dose can control you. Um, again, it's a parody. It's Cheech and Chong. This is from 1978, when the THC content of that, uh, I don't even know if I can call it a joint, whatever that is, um, is in the range of 3 or 4% THC. We're approaching 25% now, which is why I brought up before, we've monkeyed up the plant pretty significantly, and it may not be for the best. They're driving here, and one of the things that obviously is an issue when this gets out into public use is the safety on the road. University of Iowa has a beautiful, huge driving simulator like, like the pilots use, and highly sophisticated. They've tested people both with alcohol and with cannabis or combinations of the two, which, by the way, is worse than either alone. And including placebos, and with driving and awareness of being impaired, it seems that someone under the influence of alcohol is not as aware of it. I'll take the keys and, and just go off doing what they're doing, while someone under the influence of cannabis may be a little more aware of their buzz and, and may be less inclined to do it, may, maybe being overcautious. And you know that person on the road, because they're the ones in a highway going 30 miles an hour and showing one universal trait with pot the inability to stay in a lane. So you, you, when you're behind that person, you, you sort of know it. But this is available, as well as what's available are preventable causes of death. And there's a change, statistically, of what's going on globally in terms of tobacco smoking's coming down. And that is a public health victory. It, it really means a lot because it is the, still the leading cause of preventable death in the world, while drug abuse is going up. So. The statistics are there. We know what to expect of it. I just wanted to point this out because tobacco is inextricably connected with cannabis and vice versa. As far as the safety issue, yes, cannabis is listed at the bottom with a very low toxicity, but that toxicity is measured against how the other ones are. Again, if it doesn't stop you breathing doesn't mean it doesn't affect outcome. That person going 30 miles an hour off the edge of an embankment represents a threat to themselves with a possible lethal outcome. So what about kids? This is, this is a hot topic. It has been. It always, we want to protect our children. And we know that in the last 20 or so years that the rate of alcohol and cigarette use, I said cigarettes was going the way down as a public health history, in kids is actually going down. But cannabis is going up. And this is the same time frame, essentially, where states are legalizing it, at least maybe giving youth not simply the access, but the impression that, well, it's a medicine. It must not be 
you know, bad that way. Now that it's legal, we, we must have a different disposition. So, like the results of the Dunedin study or not, it's not perfect, but we do know certain things about pot, as I've listed here, about its cognitive impairment. Not only now, but if chronically used by kids starting young, 20 years later, you can measure, as that one longitudinal study did, the effects on IQ, how smart you are. It's your ability to problem solve, which basically stays with you in a normal amount that, not, maybe not normal, maybe you're brilliant or dumb, but 100 is the score of an 50th percentile IQ. It drops about eight points at this longitudinal study showed, and it was a fairly well-constructed study, but over those 20 years in, this, in the kids that started with heavy use and consistently maintained it, 20 years later, this was measurable. Why is that a concern? Because people say, oh, well, it went from 100 to 92. That's still a low A, right? Mm -mm. That's not the way IQ works. The 50th percentile on a bell-shaped curve is a score of 100. When you take eight points away, that 100 becoming a 92 now puts you at the 29th percentile. So if you don't know your kid's IQ, would you like to have the risk of having them come out as the 29th sharpest pencil in a box of 100 by starting young and continuing? We need more longitudinal studies like this uh, to get to the bottom of it. And I just wanted to point this out. This is NIH material presented about two years ago. I want to point out now about the business end of things because that target, that endocannabinoid system target, it's about money. And we all know that that's one of the driving forces with the political and legislative agendas that have advanced throughout the United States over the last 20 years. And here's what's coming. And it's already here. So, in essence, this is, I wanted to show this because it is an issue of public health and maybe more than an individual's right. That at least is the way the federal government is looking at it and will continue to look at it for that benefit-risk ratio. I can tell you as an anesthesiologist experience with giving drugs far more dangerous than pot ever thought of being, that I never got paid for putting anybody to sleep. I always got paid when they woke up, better than they went to sleep. And we use balanced risk reduction. That basic philosophy is the way all physicians practice to get the safest outcome. So this next slide looks complicated, but I'm going to take you through it because I'd like you to have a good understanding for how this political agenda has advanced and the business end of it because this slide, what I want to show you is, first of all, this is a slide of only reports by users. So it may underestimate actually how many people are using it, but the legend on the right talks about are people using it once or twice a year? Are the people using it a few times a month, uh, many times a month, daily? So the key thing I want to point out to you are the black area all the way in the bottom left. Per year, you'll find out that a daily user comprises of all pot users about 10%. And isn't it interesting that that sort of is where we consider the, uh, the tendency towards addiction to be roughly in that 10% range, if we're 9, 11 but it seems to settle around there. So those are your daily users. If it doesn't kill you the way alcohol or opiates would, it's still showing a dependence, maybe disorder, but certainly dependency if it's used every day. And so what I want to point out to you now, instead of the black area, is you see the green area with the stripes through it? That's meant to represent people who are occasional users. It says one to three here. But I want to show you, if you look specifically at that green area, one-third of all cannabis users report using it less than four times a month, or about four times a month. That's your weekend user. And so the interesting thing is the weekend user represents of all consumption just about 2% of all consumption. Isn't that interesting? That's not how the industry would plan to make money. And it is going to be about money. So you see the area of the black on the far right column? That's the daily user. That's the daily users responsible for about 60% of all consumed cannabis. And by comparison, if you look at alcohol, I promise you it's not the housewife buying a $12 bottle of Chablis at your supermarket that keeps the alcohol industry there. It's the daily user. I want to point this out because this is self-reported and sort of a parallel to alcohol there are connections between tobacco and alcohol that are lessons learned 
that I promise you are key considerations from the federal government in a public health interest. So let's look at the plant just a moment, okay? I, I'm an agricultural scientist. I'm a master gardener, educator of Florida's master gardeners. And the plant traditionally is a 20 to 22 foot plant grown in one growing season. And that's the size of it. That's why it was used by human beings as a textile. That's why Columbus's ship sails and riggings were all made of, of hemp. It works, it has been used, even clothing made of hemp. Today's plant though, where the flowering buds of the female flower um, is where the chemicals are contained. And this is what, what's being um, approached for the concentrations. It mentions here that, but the structures that they're contained in are called trichomes. They look like a little golf ball on a tee or a mushroom. And those trichomes, if you look closely, you don't even need a big magnifying glass. You can see this almost with the naked eye. They're what give the flower but that silver and crusted look. If you rub off those little balls and just put them together, you've got hashish. So this is where the chemicals are manufactured, not only the cannabinoids, but the terpenes also. The cannabinoids have increased, as I've said, from about 4% all the way up around 25% now, depending on testing. But the terpenes are found there too. The terpenes are fascinating because they do affect things. Think of animals. Before you eat something, even when you eat something, you smell it first. If it smells right, you go for it. If it doesn't, that's just the way we're hardwired. So smells do play with our brains. And how interesting is it that smells have such a deep-seated spot in our minds to where, has anybody experienced where you haven't smelled something in 30 years? Um, and, and suddenly you smell something, and it brings back a vivid memory, but you couldn't bring it back unless you smelled that smell again. It's hard to conjure up. That's the way we're hardwired. This happens to be Landrace fields of pot. Not the one I showed you in the last picture, but these are ones that have been around for hundreds of years. And it's interesting that those fields had almost an even balance, a one-to-one -one ratio between THC and CBD, not known at the time. Everything changed, though, in the early 1970s. This is Richard Evan Schultes from Harvard, a renowned ethnobotanist who found subspecies Afghanica. We're talking about Afghani Kush here. And it's a four, four to five foot squatty plant, lots of THC, flowers freely, and it has a lot of a terpene called myrcene. Myrcene is very different than the other terpenes in that it's not simply sedating, relaxing, or calming. Myrcene is hypnotic. As an anesthesiologist, you know the difference. That's the real stoner's high. Um, and look for myrcene, and I don't think that that's necessarily the best thing to have in most of the varietals today, nor should we have necessarily the genetics of this particular plant featured as heavily as it is, but guess why it's there? It's a four-foot plant, and for all of those decades of hybridizing with it, it's easy to hide from a helicopter. That, that's why you see this particular plant's genetics in everything. So since 1970, then, there has been a trend. And that trend before 1970 had one-to-one -one ratios with THC and CBD. And in fact, after 1970, something happened largely because of that plant getting into hybrids that were meant to feature that THC. And so now you have chemotypes, or the chemicals that are in the plant, reflecting that preference to THC year after year after year. Those dominant traits from Afghani Kush and also another called skunk number one, for those of you who understand the different varietals, uh, have a lot of myrcene and a lot of THC. So over those years, since 1970, we've had more and more and more THC featured in those cultivars that we're now familiar with. And that has, to me, unbalanced the plant. And if you can understand the value now being seen on why CBD is important to mitigate some of the side effects, including paranoia of THC, it would make sense. The same thing is actually happening more recently, fortunately, with CBD being rediscovered. So now you can have some plant varietals with up to 15% of CBD with no side effects, but it too is actually unbalanced in a sense that Charlotte's Web uh, may not help as many people as you might think. Maybe a little THC in there might have had a different outcome. We might not know right now. But what I want to point out, the top line here is it says the unbalanced modern plant is actually devolving from a traditionally balanced plant, which is why it stayed in human agriculture for those 10,000 years. Uh, this is from Leafly, and it shows how those balanced one-to-one -one strains in the middle are, are fairly significant. And let's get right to 21st century now, because when I trained in medicine, it's the 20th century. And I think that'll be regarded, particularly the second half, of being 
scientific discovery for pharmacy were about receptor-specific uh, chemicals. And so my career was based on that. But 21st century is about genetics. The Human Genome Project finished very end of 99. The first plant genome, Aridopsis in 2003. The first cannabis genome in 2011. So we're just now learning about genetics. And this is a little future there, but I want you to try to follow me because we're at a very unique time in history now, 2018. And it's not only about the plant, it's not only about the science, it's about data. And data is a lot easier to collect and disseminate now than it was 50 years ago, let alone 10 years ago. That chart on the right represents each line, a particular varietal of cannabis that's had its genomics um, deciphered. And this is a couple years ago, there's hundreds now, but at that point there may be about 120 or so. And so what I want to point out is that there were some common lineage that you could actually find from these plants from likely reflecting where they came from, which ancient areas that, again, may have reflected a better balance of cannabinoids in particular, and maybe their terpene content as well. But there's a technology called CRISPR. And what it does is it enables a researcher or scientist that's used on food crops already to extract a certain part of code for a favorable trait and put it into a plant that may not have it. That's a very simplistic way to put it. But wouldn't it be interesting then, if we know these ancestral plants, has anybody ever tasted, say, an heirloom strawberry or an heirloom tomato? They're things that don't really exist anymore. You can't buy them in the grocery store. They don't look as good or stay as shiny. But for really what you're looking for, the taste, the flavor, they're unparalleled. So wouldn't it be interesting if the genetic roots that now we're discovering a lot about with these different varietals that came from all over the world, but started in, in that Asia area. Those are landrace plants. They have a balance of chemicals that co-evolve with people. And right now I can tell you there is a search for the holy grail plant. Everybody's trying to do it. And yet I've told you at the same time that today's modern plant has devolved into something terribly unbalanced. We're kind of looking for where that holy grail plant might be and there are smart people out there who know how to use that CRISPR technology. So in terms of looking for the ideal plant then, the search is on. But the search has been accelerated by two things. The efficiency of global communications makes this something that globally now is accelerating the discovery process about cannabis and other aspects of medicine. And then the sharing of scientific data is critically important here. Because the Human Genome Project was not kept, and you have to buy it to use the information. It was disseminated worldwide, use it. And that has also greatly accelerated the discovery of new, new cures for things. So the essence of appropriate pharmacy is called personalized medicine. It means, well, what, why should it be that I can take a medicine for my blood pressure, and you could take another one, and we have different outcomes? Well, personalized medicine is key to the future of pharmacy, and wouldn't it be cool if cannabis, by going way back, revealed cultivars grown in the African continent, Indian subcontinent, Asia, areas where people for not 10 or 20 or 30 years like now, but for thousands of years, cultivated and kept cannabis in their culture. So what I'm describing to you is really the uberization, in a sense, of bringing technology and science together, because while you can't transmit or transport as much as a seed across a state line. You know what you can transmit? Code. And so could reading the, the tea leaves be considered then instead of reading the cannabis leaves for the future, uh, for predicting personalized medicine's future? I know that gets a little out there, but the technology's there. The application of it is all that awaits. I wanted to conclude more with a few comments, though, about what I said in the beginning was what was really the essential components. The science is there. The reasoning hasn't quite arrived yet. Uh, this was, well, from Obama in his farewell speech, saying without some common baseline facts, without a willingness to admit new information and concede that your opponent is making a fair point and that science and reason matter, We'll keep talking past each other, making common ground and compromise impossible. So with that understanding, you want to do the right thing. As healers, that's why we're here. We're law-abiding citizens. We work within the constraints of the system of government and culture that we're part of. We can change that. That's why we vote. But it still comes down to the basic question that healers, and I'm not only saying physicians necessarily, as it says here, but 
Should a physician offer compassionate access to cannabis while it's still under its federal prohibition? I referred before to the American Medical Association about an answer to it, and ethics then, from the AMA, can talk about it on the basis of what's called medical legal ethics. And if there's ever a subject that has a medical legal connection, it's this one, of course. So here's what the AMA says in its principle of medical ethics about when a physician shall respect the law and also recognize a responsibility to seek changes in those requirements which are contrary to the best interests of the patient. Sounds good. Sounds appropriate. Sounds noble. Hasn't worked. And that's because those physicians, as I said, have two licenses, the federal license, which they're not prepared to see patients and advocate on that patient's behalf. So that presents a problem with how we normally would solve to find the answer to that basic ethical question using medical legal ethics. There's a different school of ethics that's called bioethics. For those of you not familiar with bioethics, it's a field of ethics that evolved that didn't only involve medical, legal, or doctors and lawyers, but the full community to be in that discussion. And it evolved largely after World War II when we now had to confront certain science questions we never knew we had to answer before. Atomic energy, there's a good one. And bioethics is then a way of problem solving that lends itself to an ethical position to tell doctors and the patients no to do the right thing. There are basically two ways to approach an ethical question like this. One is to find a compromise that neither side for or against may like, but both can reluctantly accept and find some common middle ground to agree upon. That's the great compromise. That's how a lot of our nation developed. Hasn't worked in this field either. Why? Well, think about uh, all right, stem cells. We're going to have a speaker uh, later ab about stem cells. And it actually took a bioethical conversation to get past a previous president's administration's restrictions on which stem cell lines could be used for therapeutic research and ultimately for human use. That's over a decade ago, and think about all the lives that have been saved today in fairly quick order as a result of advances in stem cell technology. So I would propose that the same kind of thought logic reasoning could be used to get past the biggest can cannabis conundrum, which answers that first question, through a bioethical approach. And back in 2014, I started to come up with what I wanted to make was a statement that was not the compromise but one that would be an irrefutable statement that neither side for or against could refute. And so there's simply two sentences, the first one from a patient's perspective, the second from the healers. And the phrasing of it, and this is not etched in stone anywhere, anyone who would like to contribute to this, it's an evolving dialogue, says that seeking relief for the physical, psychological, or spiritual symptoms of disease is an instinctual force of human nature and may contribute to medicinal use. I mention all three of those because I, I'm trained as the, the doc who introduced me, Dr. McHugh, mentioned that I'm trained in pain management, but I'm trained in pain management back in the mid-1980s when it was taught along with addiction medicine. Nowadays, addiction medicine is generally a subspecialty, a boarded subspecialty of psychiatry. We don't communicate necessarily the same way understanding a patient's need with this yin-yang balance of pain and addiction having to be thought of. So the second sentence here was meant to then be an irrefutable statement, not from the patient's perspective as the first is, but from the healers or the physicians. That's why I didn't even use the word doctor. I just said the treatment of intolerable symptoms is an honorable task that a society bestows upon its healers to provide humane relief. More than that, I don't know if it really has to be expressed other than that seemed to me uh, to be a sentence that was saying, do the right thing and otherwise to anyone who is the legislator trying to practice medicine, get out of the way. So, and maybe as a concluding slide here, and then if we have any time for questions, I'd be happy to. Cannabis is a little different, let's face it. Um, in states like Nevada, it, it worked there very, very well because Nevada's full of <laughs> indulgence temptations or temptations, indulgences. So it sort of fits in with that state because its economy and its whole mindset is built around gambling, sex, alcohol, um, all, all these things that make Nevada, Nevada. And it, 
embraced bringing cannabis in to make it legal because it is regarded as an indulgence temptation. It can work there. My concern, especially with the current formulary that the unbalanced plant brings, are the effects on memory, the preponderance of myrcene, the stoner effect being hypnotic. You couldn't necessarily assure a Midwest industrial state that its citizens, if having access to it, their productivity would go down. And, and that'll be a hard thing to get past, especially looking at the modern plant being as unbalanced as it is. So if you can see the imagery here in, in the joint there with the smoke coming up, uh, that is a temptation. But as you're looking at it, you realize that at the same time, that temptation has the genie that very often gives you those two wishes before the third one is the gotcha one. So it cautions us really to be careful what we wish for. And it's for the simple reason as we started and end with, because science and reason really do matter. Thank you.